Easter Sunday is coming up, so we are in our Easter services. We'll take a break from the book of Mark. And I want to take, take you to John's Gospel today, chapter 17. I want to talk to you about this today. I want to talk to you about the hour has come. The hour has come. So right before the, um, the agony prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane is this really unique, long prayer, the longest prayer we have documented from Jesus in the Bible in John chapter 17. And I, I want to take you there to uh, talk about this topic about the hour is coming and, and give you some background on this. That's kind of talked about a lot in John's gospel. Really in all the gospels it's known that there's a time limit to the ministry of Jesus. He only has so long. It's a three-year ministry for a 30-year-old uh, to do by the time he's in his 30s, early 30s, maybe 30 when the ministry is finished. So for pretty quick. And because of that, he had to accomplish the things he had to accomplish in a short amount of time. So he's always was talking about the time. In fact, John chapter 2, John chapter 2, there was a, a wedding that Mary, his mother, wanted him to do something great. Well, he did turn water into wine, but he didn't want to do any more than that. Why? Because in verse 4, he said, my hour has not yet come. Then in John chapter 7, verse 6, again, early in the ministry, he's starting to get known as the ministry gains more traction. There's more conversation about him. So in chapter 7, verse 6, he again kind of stays away from the spotlight. Why? Because my time has not yet come. Then we get into Mark, or John chapter 7, verse 30, and now there's a little more recognition and opposition rising up against him. And there are some people who are looking to maybe arrest him. And the Bible says in John chapter 30, his hour had not yet come. Then in John chapter 8, verse 20, now they really do want to arrest him. He's been speaking in the temple. They want to put him in jail. But the Bible says they just weren't able to. Why? The Bible says because his hour had not yet come. Then in John chapter 12, everything changes. In John chapter 12, now it's not just an annoyance. Now it's not that we'd like to talk to him. We might take him and see if he can be charged, or we are going to put him in prison. Now it's because we want to kill him. And when that happens in John chapter 12, verse 23, then Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, which is to be crucified. Then in John chapter 13, verse 1, right before the Lord's Supper, again, Jesus knows that it is time because it says Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Then what you get in John's Gospel is the Lord's Supper in chapter 13, then really intense, great teaching in chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16. Then chapter 17. Now we're just about to the prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane. And we get this remarkable prayer in John chapter 17 that has this phrase in it, Father, now speaking directly, Father, the hour has come. It's time for the Lord Jesus to start to make that walk. That will lead him to the cross. So John chapter 17, we're going to look at the whole prayer. I just want to read verses 1 through 5. So let's stand, okay? And we'll honor the reading of God's Word. This is what the Bible says. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father... The hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave Him authority over all flesh, that to all you have given Him, He may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Let me join me as we pray. God, thank you for this truth. And thank you for our time together to look at and learn from your word. I pray that we would. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. This prayer gives remarkable insight to something we know as the doctrine of glorification. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. It also gives remarkable insight to the love that he has for his followers. So there are three things I want us to look at from the text and see what we can learn from this. The first is this, his prayer for his followers to be kept in his name. Verses 1 through 5, we see this unique connection between God the Father and God the Son. And the idea of glorification comes up. So God has glorified the Son, giving the Son authority over all flesh. God has glorified the Son in that He is the key to salvation. It is through His sacrifice on the cross that redemption is possible for humanity. 
The Son has glorified the Father by keeping the plan. Because remember, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, He was in the beginning with God. And then the Word became flesh. God is omnipresent, so He can still be God in heaven and God on earth, and that's what happens. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the only begotten of the Father. So Christ is here, and that glorifies the Father. Because he submitted to the plan of the Father, takes on the form and the flesh of man, and is now living a life that then will be perfect according to the law, so that his sacrifice can be for the sins of humanity. He glorifies the Father by keeping the plan. And now he goes to the Father and asks that the Father would glorify him as he goes to the cross. One commentator said it this way, that Christ is asking for God to put honor on Christ, to sustain Him and to carry Him to this hour. And this unity that exists in God the Father and God the Son, this oneness that exists will assure the mission will be completed. Now, you could do a, an entire series just on those five verses. Remarkable conversation. As God the Son talks with God the Father, God the Son in the current form of flesh and God the Father God who is in that eternal also form that he has taken. And, and Jesus even says in verse 5, and then I'll be able to return to you so it can be just like we were before where we are together in eternity past and in eternity future. Hard even to really have the mental horsepower to understand this conversation, but we get to read it. And, and then this is also amazing. Verse 6, we're just six verses in to this longest documented prayer that Jesus has in the Bible. Six verses in, he starts to talk about humans. In, 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 in verse 6, he just writes to this, that God, that Christ mentions that he has glorified the Father by revealing God's name to those God has given to him through salvation. So it brings glory to the Father that Christ goes through the plan that leads to his sacrifice on the cross. It brings glory to the Father that the people the Father had given to him, he then shared the name of, of Christ, shared the gospel, shared God's name with him, God's plan with him, and then them, because of God's grace, through their faith, they are now keeping the word. They're keeping the name. And it says that, I glorified you by sharing you with these men. They took your name and kept it. Except Judas. And in that, it brings glory to God. Think about that for a second. So as much as God the Father glorifies God the Son and honors Him, God the Son glorifies God the Father and honors Him. A part of that process is the redemptive work of Christ through humanity that the salvation of man brings glory to God and glory to the Son. What are we, what are we doing in verse 6? Seems like we should be in like verse 50 or something. But already in verse 6, this brings glory to God. These 12 disciples that he's talking about specifically, honoring the Father, pointing the disciples to his name, and they kept it. A.T. Robinson says it this way, Jesus claims loyalty and fidelity in these men, with one exception, Judas, in verse 12. He does not claim perfection for these men, but they have at least held on to the message of the Father in spite of doubt and wavering. Because they were just normal people. Amen. The disciples were normal people. Now, we didn't get the kind of face-to-face -face conversation that they did. We didn't get the kind of teaching, personal teaching that the disciples did. We also haven't been asked to do the things that the disciples were asked to do. However, in one way, we are very similar to the disciples. The, the disciples were ordinary people with doubts, and they weren't perfect, but because of God's grace through faith, they're His people. You and I, we are not perfect. Amen. We have doubts, and we waver, and we sin, and in our imperfection, by God's grace, we can be His people. By His grace, through my salvation in Christ, I'm His people. You are His people. Us, normal, us, just ordinary, us, sinful, us as imperfect as we are because Christ is so perfect that we are His people. Because of His grace, through our faith. And, and then the most of the rest of this prayer ends up being about People, did you watch the game last night? You watched the Duke Carolina game last night? See that? Now, now here's the reason I mention this, because I, it's cultural context. 
preaching, a lot of preaching is cultural context. I live in the South. Basketball is huge in the South. Duke and North Carolina doesn't get any bigger than that. They played last night in the Final Four. So any preacher worth his salt had better find a way to get the Duke Carolina game into the sermon. Right? So here's how I'm going to try to do it. See what you think. It doesn't matter because last sermon, you're going to hear it anyway. So it's not like you could say, don't do that. This is it. This is it. Did you know, now those guys playing last night, uh, unbelievable. I mean, they're so young. They're just so young. And all this pressure is on them, right? I mean, the winner goes to the championship. And it's Duke Carolina in the final four. It's never happened before. And if Coach K loses, that's it. He's done. And so it's like, man, this is big. And if, if you're a Carolina fan, I see lots of blue out there. Carolina blue out there today. How many of you were happy at the result of the game last night? Yeah. Mm. How many of you uh, are not happy? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. It's just too sad to clap. Just, I get it. I totally, I totally get it. I'm not really in the game because Ohio State didn't, we kind of sit down and be quiet during basketball season, but, but I, man, what, what an incredible, incredible game. Did you know the disciples' average age was about the same age as those kids playing in that game last night? Do you know that? You know that, uh, you know, Jesus is 30. And so it would be common in that culture for the followers to be younger than the leader. So that would, they say, some people would guess that maybe Peter, married guy, maybe Peter was 28, maybe 30, but probably younger than Jesus. Some commentators have suggested that Mark may have been 13. 13, young guy, really smart, tax collector. You don't really have anything else going on, and you're young, and boom, tax collector. And that may be 15, others have said. Average age of the disciples probably was, if not younger, probably most of them teenagers, probably the age of those kids that played last night. Now think about that. The, the Messiah comes to them at that age and offers them to take his name. To take his name. Here's the message. Here's the message. God the Father has prepared this way for humanity through the perfect life, death, and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. As much as they understood of that, because they, if you can tell at the end, they still don't really understand the death part, but that they're going to be his followers, and he's going to teach them, show them miraculous things, and tell them about the coming kingdom of God. And these young people say, we'll do it. And then even as the pressure rises up, even as people start to look at Jesus and want to kill him, even as Jesus sends them out, now you go do it. Go do what? You go do the things that I'm doing. Excuse me? Go heal sick people. Go raise dead people from the dead. Go cast out demons. Go do that. But make sure you preach about the coming kingdom of God. And then Jesus is able to say to God the Father, and they kept it. I gave them your name. They kept it. Young people, high school people, college people. You've got the opportunity to have his name. Keep it. Have his message. Keep it. College people. Oh, you're going to wait for the older people. No, 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 no. No, you can, be, you can be pretty young and keep his name and share that message and glorify, this is, glorify the Father by the way you live your life, keeping his name. And in old people like us, what, do we, I mean, what excuse do we have? I mean, if young people here, young people, they kept the name, they did it. I bring glory to you, God, because they kept your name. What should he rightly expect of us old people who've been saved for a long time, or say we are? Saved for a long time. Well, I think he'd probably be right to accept, expect quite a bit. He's given much, much is required. I think he probably should expect quite a bit. But to think, wherever you are in that station of life, wherever, wherever you are on that spectrum of spiritual maturity, that it brings glory to God the Father, that the plan of the gospel has taken hold of your life, and you then are a part of bringing glory to God. Amen. That's incredible. Hard to believe we have the opportunity to do that, but by His grace we do. So now here's the question. Are you? Are you bringing the glory to God? Are you bringing glory to God by faith, trusting Christ as your Lord and Savior? And if you said you did, are you living in a way that backs that up? Not that you're proving your faith by your works, but you are working because of your faith. You don't work to get saved, but because you're saved, you're doing these things that show that you're a saved person. Are you? Because if so, you're bringing glory to God. Well, I'm younger. I'll wait till I get older. No. Because the young people did it too. First thing we see is he is his prayer for his followers to be kept in his name. Now look at what the second thing is. His prayer for his followers to be kept from the evil one. 
In verses 11 through 19, Christ continues to pray for his followers. But watch how he does it now. Look what he says in verse 11. Now he asks the Father. First, he's thankful that they kept his name. In verse 11, he asks the Father to keep them in your name, preserve them, protect them. Verse 12, as I was doing that, keeping them in your name. This call to protect them and to use them then leads to, in verses 17 through 19, this prayer for sanctification. Preserve them and protect them, but don't isolate them. Grow them up so that they can be used. Preserve and protect them from evil, from the evil one, but grow them up through sanctification, that they might be more like Christ, that they would reject sin and be drawn to righteousness in a world where the evil one exists, in a world where evil exists. Now they are the target because Christ is leaving. And Christ, in the hour has come, he is leaving. The Holy Spirit will indwell them, but Christ will be gone. And now, God, keep them in your name. Preserve them in your name. Secure them in your name, but use them in your name. Look what he says in verse 15. I don't ask that you take them out of the world. Keep them in the world, but keep them from the evil one. Why not take them out of the world? Why not? Why not get saved and leave right away? Go right to heaven. <laughs> That's true. Why not? Why would God say stay? Why does Jesus say stay? Their testimony is valuable. The testimony of their faith is valuable. The message of the gospel is valuable. And Christ wants them in the world. So why did you not go? Christ wants you in the world. Keep them, God. Protect them, God. Preserve them, God. Use them, God. Grow them. Use them. He also says in this that he wants them to live in joy while living in a world where evil exists. Live in joy in a world where evil exists. Now let me stop there just for a second. It's probably relatively important because evil exists now. Amen? Amen. And we see it and evil exists. And because evil exists and we see evil exists, we know these are the worst times. These are awful times. These are terrible times. These are just, okay. But let's remember the people that he's sending out and said, protect them from the evil one. If you could transport a Christian today back into those days when the disciples are spreading the gospel and while the mission is being going and the churches are being planted and the Roman Empire is growing more and more impatient, let's say you could transport to a day where the disciples are in a situation where you were next to a disciple and you said, man, things in my time are worse than they have ever been. And the disciples then said, oh, you, there's a Nero in your time too that's impaling Christians, lining the streets, putting oil on them, lighting them on fire so they can light the way for Roman citizens, burning Christians. Is that happening in your day too? And the Christian of today would say, well, no, but the gas prices are terrible. <laughs> I'm sorry? Gas, gas, we have, yeah, we have, it's terrible. And inflation, don't get me started on inflation. Um, yeah, but, you know, in our situation, we don't have any say who the government is. Do you get a say in who the government is? Oh, yeah, we, we, we vote on who the government is, who our leaders are. You do. They let, you, they let Christians speak into the world of politics? They let you do that? Uh, yeah, yeah. And guess what? Uh, coming up in November is the most important election in the history of humanity. Two years from that will be the most important election in the history of humanity. And then four years from that will be the most important election in the history of humanity. Because not only do we get the opportunity to speak about our politics in the world that we live in today, as opposed to the world that they lived in when Jesus sent them out, we actually would probably speak better about gas prices than the gospel. We would probably have, have more to say about inflation than the incarnation. We might have more to say angry about our politicians than about the prophet who came and said that the Messiah would come and then the Messiah did come and say the kingdom of God is coming and then by his sacrifice on the cross give us the opportunity to by faith live forever in heaven with Jesus. We can speak and complain about the issues of today that we think are awful. We don't have a lot to say about the God who rescues us and is awesome. 
I don't ask you to take them out of the world. Leave them in the world and give them joy. Give them joy. Yeah, but how can I have joy when it's so terrible today? I don't know. Ask Thomas, who was martyred for the faith. Ask Paul, who had his head cut off because he wouldn't convert. Ask Peter, who church history tells us had to watch his wife be crucified because he wouldn't deny Christ. If you don't deny Christ, we'll crucify your wife. Peter looks at his wife and says, remember the Lord. And then they crucify her and come to him and say, all right, we're going to crucify you now if you won't reject Christ. He said, crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to die the way Christ died. And in that world, Jesus said to the Lord God, let them have joy. Becky's not here today. You know, we kind of mentioned, we haven't talked a lot, but we kind of mentioned Becky's been sick a lot lately. And she's been in and out of church. She's done announcements a couple times, then she'll be gone for a little bit. Well, it turns out um, Becky's philosophy on when you're sick is just work harder. If you're sick, just keep working and it'll go away. That's not great medical advice not great because then as the infection continued to carry out in her body and take over and do all that sort of thing then she would go and she would see the doctor and find out there were lots of other things to have to deal with and so we we do that but again she just just you know well it turns out that it got so bad for my um, lovely wife that she was admitted to the hospital on Friday she had surgery on Saturday She's recovering in the hospital today and could be there um, into the first part of next week. So, um, man, it, you know, it hurts that my girl's not here. Uh, I'm learning things, though, about the body. You know, the, the design of the body, and one of the, the doctors said before they did the surgery on Becky, explained to me what was going to happen and then why it was going to happen, and mentioned, you know, that he mentioned something about the design of the human body was flawed. He even kind of made a joke. He said, I don't, I don't know who designed this, but it's not a very good design. And I thought, hmm. I got a pretty good idea who designed it. But, you know, it stopped me in my tracks. I just wasn't expecting it. I'm just like, like huh. And you sort of give that nervous, stupid laugh, like, huh. Then I started thinking about that, that the designer. But you know what the, what the realization is? The fall of humanity really messed us up. Boy, the fall of humanity had a terrible impact on the human body. There are things in our body now that we don't even need. The fall of humanity has been really bad for our body. And because of the sin, because, you know, God gives the opportunity. I mean, everything's perfect. Nothing's dying. Everything's be around forever. Now, if there's a knowledge of good and evil, if you want the knowledge of good and evil and you go take that and bite from what's on that tree, if that's what you want, then you'll die. And there will be pain and suffering in your life. And man did what man does. Because man, man doesn't want to believe God will actually do it, doesn't want to believe God's word, wants to be like God, and so takes and eats, and we would have done the same thing. But you know, it's had an awful effect on us. Our bodies, the perfect designer designed these great bodies, and because of the mar of sin on the person of humanity, on the people of humanity, it has really messed us up. We're all going to die. We're all going to die now. And, and some painful on the way. Happy Easter, everybody. You're going to die. <laughs> You're going to die. That back that's bothering you when you get out of bed, pretty soon you won't be able to stand up straight. How about that? Your hands that like you, that arthritic thing, you're going to get worse. Yep, eyesight, pff, not going to get any better either. Probably won't be able to hear for very much longer. And then you'll die. Something, something's killing you now. You just don't know what it is, but you're going to die. And if, if, if it's nothing else that kills you, you have these things. Look this up on the internet called telomeres. Telomeres got these little long, sort of like built like this with kind of a head and then these long things like this. And as long as they're nice and long, you're going to live. Guess what happens? As you, as you get older, they get smaller. And then they go away and you die. So if it's nothing else that's going to kill you, you're going to die from bad telomeres. Take that to the bank. So the human body wouldn't have been a problem except for the fall of man. Wouldn't have been a problem except for the fall of man. Now it's a problem. The wages of sin are death. Now, because of great medical advancements, Becky is alive. And I was shared with me the other day that a couple generations ago she'd be dead. So I'm thankful for the advancements in medicine for her to be here. That is obviously a good thing. But I'm sitting in the hospital room with my wife, and she's sore and, and you know, medicated and all that stuff. And with this morning, I'm still there with her this morning at 5 a.m. We're just talking about the message, talking about the sermon. And then Becky sits up and says, you know what? God is good. And I thought, man, God is good. He is good. And so here, look, 
There are bad things in life, struggle. Uh, gas prices are bad, I get it. Inflation is bad. I'm not saying that's trivial. It's, it's bad, I get it, it's bad. Bad things, people hate Christians these days. I get it, all that stuff's bad. But man, I would rather be a Christian than anything else. I love this life I'm living. I love it, I love it. I love it because God is good. I mean, the world is bad, but yeah, that's right, the evil one lives here. But he's going to keep me from the evil one because the evil one doesn't have claim on me, doesn't have control over me, doesn't have anything to do with me. He can't indwell me. The Holy Spirit is there. I'm going to live forever in heaven with Jesus. And while I'm here on this earth, the call has been to keep his name and let people know the message. And because he will keep me. Praise be to God. One more thing. His prayer for his followers to be kept in unity. Verses 20 and 21. Now the impact of the ministry of the followers will then produce more followers. Look at this in verses 20 and 21. Jesus then says, I don't ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that, we, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. So I'm asking you, God, I'm, I'm asking and praying and believing in on not just behalf of those who are following me now, the disciples now, but those who will hear from the disciples and by faith take the name of Christ. Think about that. Probably the best example of that is Thomas. Thomas in the New Testament, Jesus is raised from the dead. He shows himself to the disciples. But Thomas said, I don't, I don't believe it until I can put my finger in the hole in his hands and my hand in the side. I'm not going to believe it until I can do those things. And they say, well, he's here. No, he's, I don't believe it until I see it and touch it. And so then Jesus appears again. Thomas is there. And Jesus says, put your finger here, put your hand here. N don't be unbelieving, be believing. Thomas then says this remarkable thing. He says, my Lord and my God. One of the great things any of the disciples ever said, my Lord and my God. You're, you're everything. Jesus says, you know, that's great that you believe. Blessed are those who won't see me and yet believe. Think about that. So Thomas goes out on this ministry, traveling around the region, telling them who Christ is. I've seen him. I've put my fingers there. My, I've seen him. And people who hadn't seen him said, I believe just like you do. I believe as much as you do. You were given all that exposure to him, but you know what? The Holy Spirit has made it clear in me, and I believe just like you do. And can you imagine, Thomas? That's just what Jesus said, that I would see people who would believe like I do and didn't get to see him like I did. Then you can see why someone would be willing to be martyred for the faith, knowing that, that, that he is that good and that right and that perfect a Savior. But here's another thing he's doing. This is cast out to you and me. You and me, for those of you who are here and saved, you didn't see him. You didn't see Jesus. You didn't touch him. You didn't, you didn't get to walk with him and talk with him. You didn't, you didn't get that. But you don't have any doubts, right? Oh, if you have doubts, everyone, I guess, would have some. But you know that you know that you know Jesus is Lord. And the things that you don't know about him, you know that his ways are not your ways, his thoughts are not your thoughts. They're higher than you. But you, by faith, trust Christ, and you believe. Maybe you're here today, maybe you're watching today, and you don't. Jesus was praying out into advance that others might hear the gospel and by faith be saved. So if you're here today, here's the gospel. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But because of his grace, he had a plan in place before we ever even needed a savior. And here's that plan that Christ would come and live the life we couldn't live. Then Christ would die a sacrificial death that we couldn't die. Then Christ is raised from the dead to show his power over death, power over sin. He took the wrath of God so that we wouldn't have to. And then all we have to do is because of his grace, by our faith, trust Christ as Lord and Savior. Ask him to come into your life and change your life and save your life and make you new. You don't have to understand everything. You just have to understand this. You need Jesus and he's there. And you by faith can trust Christ and then join this body of believers. And you know what I love? I love because I love what he says this. Let, this, let them be united. So you may be a new Christian, an old Christian, a young Christian, whatever it is, but you're united now in this body. If you're a member here, you're united. If you've been coming for a long time, you're in the body of Christ. Man, I'm glad you're here in this body. This is a great body. Let me tell you how great this body is. We don't have a single knucklehead in this church, not one. <laughs> I, mean, I, I said early in the early service, I said, you know, there are some knuckleheads, but you know, I don't think there are any knuckleheads. I think this is knucklehead free. 
think there's a knuckle, now every church has knuckleheads, maybe except this. We're going to start to use it as a promotion. Come to a knucklehead free church. That's who we are. <laughs> knucklehead free. But you know, I was driving to the beach years and years ago. I used this years and years ago. There was this big subway sign on the road, and it said, Subway, clean restrooms. I thought, you don't have anything better to talk about than that? But they figure you know our sandwiches. Here's something that, that not, not everyone has on the way to the beach is clean restrooms. So you know what I did? I stopped at Subway on the way to see how clean they were. Good job, Subway. They were clean. They did they were, it wasn't false advertising. They did a good job. Lee Park Church, no knuckleheads. We gotta put that, see if that works. But I love the unity in this body. I love the unity in this body. Here's something I love being about your pastor is to go out and have people just say, hey, pastor. I don't know them necessarily. Maybe we have met or once or twice. Maybe we haven't met, but they just see me. They say, hey, pastor, you know how much I love that? I love that. I was playing golf the other day, trying to walk nine holes before it got dark. And I get to the ninth hole and I see some Lee Park people and we just start talking. And we talked all the way till the sun went down. Didn't even get to finish the round. We just kept talking. It was awesome. I went to Food Lion and I had a lady come out. And she goes, hey, pastor. I'm like, hey. And she goes, hey, look, I've got these pine berries. You know about pine berries? Every, anyone know about? Raise your hand if you know what pine berries are. Right? Yeah, like a pineapple strawberry thing. It's like a, like a, um, what is it, what is it they did? What's it called when you um, cross pollinate? They like cross pollinate. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Yeah, it was cross. They, I read it up. Cross pollinated a wild strawberry from Chile versus a strawberry, and then, but it's like a pineapple strawberry. Anyway, she says, I thought you'd want to know. So then she said, Hey, look at my pine berries. And I said, Great. And then I thought, Wow, she's letting me see her shopping, her grocery bag. So, I mean, that's pretty confident, you know. The pastor, pastor approved, look, no beer in here, you know. She's like, <laughs> look at my pine berries. And then, oh, come on, you know what I'm talking about. Because those of you, those of you who do put beer in there, I see you when I get to Food Lion. Because you're, I, I, I see, I see you. I see you. So she said, hey, pastor, you know, she's looking at my pine berries. And we just, so I, I'm like, I've never heard of a pine berry before. And she said, they're really good, actually. And so we, but I, you know, that's conversation you get to have. I'm in the hospital. Beck's in the hospital. Get to have conversation with her. Why? Because we've gone to that place and we've had prayer around that building. And one of the people in there said, thank you for your church doing that. And, in, and the food, thank you for feeding us. Well, you know, the lady who's cooking a lot of that food is in that room over there. Really, is she? And man, thank you for the way you love the community. Thank you for the way your church reaches out. That's good. That's a united body of believers wanting to take the name of Christ to the community, wanting to do it in joy. Even a suffering, we're all suffering, it's all bad, whatever, whatever. But we're doing it in joy because we get the opportunity to bear the name of Christ and tell people that Jesus saves. Amen. That's not bad, right? It's not bad at all. You have the opportunity now because of Easter coming up. As we've t Every year I say this. Studies always show that people are much more likely to accept an invitation to an Easter service than any other time of the year. Well, now you have the opportunity to go take the name of Jesus out to your friends, tell them who he is, and then ask them to come see what unity is. Ask them to come see what unity looks like in the body. Because I think we've got it here. I think we do. And if, if not, it hasn't really risen to me yet. So that's good. Isn't it nice to go to a church where we're not fighting about anything that's going to tear us up? Amen. We're not. We're not fighting about anything that's going to tear us up. And again, if you think there is something out there that's going to tear us up, and you're, you're not making enough noise for me to hear, so sorry, it didn't work. Stand with me. Let's close in a word of prayer. Knuckle Free Church. Good to see you. We got to have a song. I, no, I'm not going to try to make it up. <laughs> I got to go. My girl's ready to see me back in the hospital room. I got to go back and see her. But thank you for being here. I love you, and I am so glad to be your pastor. And, and you think, well, he doesn't know me. He's never seen me. I don't care. When you see me out, you say, hey, pastor. And we'll just talk about whatever. We'll just hang out. It'd be, it'd be cool. God, thank you for, oh, wait, no, no, no. Before I pray, let me do this. Let me do this. I'm sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. I don't want to do this in the prayer. I want to make sure that I do it with you. Maybe you are that person, right? And you read that Jesus is praying, a couple thousand years ago, Jesus is praying in advance that the message is heard and received and they might come be united with Christ. And, and maybe you're, you're here today and you're just thinking, you know what, that, the Holy Spirit really has, yeah, I get that. I need him. And, and maybe today you're ready to be a part of this body. And maybe you're ready to join. You're already saved. You're ready to be joined. Join. Maybe you're ready to get, be baptized. Maybe 
Maybe today is the day that you, by faith, trust Christ. Maybe that's today. Maybe you're here today, you know, I've, I've thought about it. I've been visiting, been thinking about it. Jeff, today is that day. To think that Jesus is praying for those who would hear the message. All people, we didn't, we didn't see him. I didn't walk with him. I wasn't there for his prayer. I wasn't there for the Last Supper. I wasn't there for any of that stuff. But I know he's alive, and he is alive in me, and the Holy Spirit has made that clear in me. And maybe today you think, I want that too. I want that too. You can have that today. Because the Holy Spirit is impressing upon you that need to, by faith, surrender to Christ. What will you do? What will you do? Because next Sunday we're going to have communion. We haven't had Lord's Supper in two years. We're going to have it next Sunday. And I promise you it'll mean a lot more to you if you come here as a saved person next Sunday. God, thank you for the opportunity we have now to place our faith in you. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. In a prayer that would rightly have just been just God the Father, God the Son, communicating about the, the doctrine of glorification, so much of it still includes your creation. And God, we are in awe of you. That you would love us. That in that prayer, that the Lord Jesus would say, these things are happening so that the people, the world would know that God loves them. These things are happening so the world would know that Christ saves. But let's shrink that world down to this room, this group, and these people. God, maybe there's someone here right now who ready, is ready to pray simply to you. I don't understand everything, but I know this. I need you in my life. So, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life and save my life. Forgive me of my sins. Make me new. I trust you. I place my faith in you because I believe in you. And God, as, as you work, as they pray, however they pray to you, as this happens in this place, God, we pray that you would be glorified because you are so worth it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.